Uh, right, it's, I've been really looking forward to hearing from Josh, uh, who, um, is, as I mentioned before, is from uh, Google Aotearoa, Google New Zealand, and uh, I'm going to just let you go for it, actually. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Josh Bailey. I'm a software engineer for Google. Um, I'm based here. I'm a one-person office. And despite the way I sound, I'm actually from Karori. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for 10 years, so I just came back in July, so uh, I guess my accent is still drifting a little bit. Um, and uh, actually, due to some very uh, fortunate timing, um, it was my housewarming uh, on Saturday night. This is Saturday night, Saturday night just gone. And uh, I want to show you two very quick videos uh, from that um, that are fairly self explanatory when I say go. And I'll go back and relate it back to what I'm going to talk about. Um, so, this is uh, a bit of a live programming, live programming exercise that um, I wasn't sure it was going to work on the day, uh, but it looks like it did. So hopefully you will be able to hear this. Do that you can write a piece of code that does something very tangible and interactive, you know, in front of you. 
Um, let's say, here's the downside, at least in my case, that um, uh, I'm not known for, uh, shall we say, excessive amount of safety precautions. <laughs> so, uh, if uh, you make a mistake in the program, you can potentially blow it up. Um, and that has happened. Uh, first version of this, I um, uh, connected a electric guitar to it. Uh, and uh, I was very excited about doing this, and I, I cut lots of corners and um, it survived, uh, I think, four notes. I thought it would go. The IGTs, the transistors in there, physically uh, just evaporate into the shrapnel. Uh, the capacitors in the DC power supply, um, the tops blow off, and the vomited all their contents everywhere. <laughs> and uh, I just couldn't look at it for six months. Just in the corner. I just couldn't look at it. Uh, but I think this is um, uh, a really good. To, to uh, get on the soapbox for a moment, um, a really neat thing about um, Arduino, I think, has a lot of uh, applications in, in teaching uh, programming. Is you know, it's a. I'll make a claim that it's uh, the language here processing is one of the you know, C family. Um, the code's fairly easy to understand. Okay, I'm, I'm using lots of pointers there because I like pointers, but you know, you could avoid having pointers. Um, there's a lot of uh, pre-existing libraries um, around. So you don't need to write lots of code to do something. Um, they actually physically, the uh, Arduino boards are quite difficult to, to damage. You, know, you can short them out, you can step, them, step on them. They're quite hard to break. Uh, and they have the, the other nice quality in that um, you can write code that causes them to control something, turn on a motor, blink a light, you know, do something that's interactive and you know, uh, causes something to happen in the real world uh, that might be so exciting to do with some people. So uh, what has this really got to do with my job? Um, Pretty much nothing. Um, I just really like and enjoy doing it. Um, well, actually, a little bit. I, I have done um, in the past uh, a lot of uh, signal processing and a lot of like embedded systems and stuff, um, and uh, a little bit of high voltage engineering kind of as well. So I, I, um, I like to try and keep in practice with it and have uh, dangerous housewarming parties. But the part that I did want to talk to you about um, that's uh, directly relevant to what Google does. Um, I have uh, a number of um, public projects uh, here in New Zealand, um, well, some parts of New Zealand, some parts of global, uh, and one of them is this, uh, this project called EMLAB, and one of the reasons why I want to talk about it um, is that uh, it cuts across a lot of what uh, Google does, so we uh, collect and organize a huge amount of information and try and make it useful. Uh, and we do it with a, um, a very powerful uh, distributed system. And one of the many reasons I wanted to come back to, to New Zealand specifically uh, was, well, apart from the fact that um, even though I don't sound like it anymore, I am, am a New Zealander. And uh, I was getting a little bit concerned that my retirement plan was seem to be based around wool and cheese. And I like those things, but I thought it would be kind of cool if uh, uh, New Zealand's future could be defined by wool, cheese, uh, movies, and uh, awesome computer programmers who know how to write uh, code that runs on really, really big, big computers and, and really, really uh, big, reliable software. Um, so I've been trying to uh, uh, get around the country, talk to people about, about it, and try and encourage um, uh, people earlier uh, to learn about writing reliable software that runs on large numbers of computers. Because I'm going to make a bet that uh, the cost of computers is going to keep going down, the cost of storage is going to keep going down, the number of devices that can talk to each other is going to keep going up. And uh, the more people that uh, we can produce here in New Zealand that know how to make those things do something useful to each other more reliably, that's really going to be a pretty good place. Pretty good place. Uh, and that's what New Zealand's about. And I think on the Google side, one of the frustrations I have as a uh, Google software engineer when I'm talking to people is uh, it's not that, that people aren't good and not smart. It's a uh, you know, standard interview question I'll ask is, uh, uh, here's a problem that I'd like you to solve. And I keep trying to make the problem bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it doesn't fit on one computer, which doesn't take very long. Um, and see how they handle the distribution of, of tasks to one, more than one computer. And it's not just uh, splitting the algorithm into um, uh, multiple pieces. It's like, well, if I have 10 computers or 100 computers, what's the probability that one of them is going to fail? You know, halfway through you know, my, my job. Um, if you have enough computers, their probability is going to be pretty high. And if you don't write software that can handle that, 
uh, then you know, in that case, we'd be out of business. Like, the system is so large, there are so many pieces that can fail any time that you, you have to write software that handles it. Um, you can't just throw up your hands and go like, oh, well, you know, the computer went away. You have to handle it. So this is uh, a little bit what uh, MWeb is about. This is a, a project that is not a Google project per se, but we're a big contributor to it. Um, uh, what we uh, are trying to promote here is the idea of a, um, a transparent, open uh, internet. Uh, if the, uh, the network is uh, very reliable and high performing, we think that's good for everybody. Um, and uh, a good way to make sure it stays that way is to actually measure it, uh, measure what the internet does uh, and uh, publish information about it so we can actually have an informed debate over what the internet's doing or not doing. Um, and uh, uh, has a number of experiments that run um, with it uh, to look at different aspects of internet performance. Um, so that could be uh, bandwidth, um, you know, how, how many bits per second you can reasonably expect as, a, uh, as an end user, uh, whether your carrier is doing anything to prioritize your traffic versus someone else's traffic. Um, not to editorialize or anything, but to make the, um, uh, the state of the network more uh, obvious. So we actually collect a, um, a lot of information. Uh, this is actually a good, uh, good summary. Um, I'm hoping to try and promote this a bit more in New Zealand. This is a, you know, a US uh, FCC statement. Um, but they, they have this radical view that um, uh, ISPs should uh, publicly disclose accurate information about what their network does. It's, it's pretty out of control. They could ever have it. Um, but um, uh, we think that's a, a really good uh, position to have, um, and uh, it's something I'll be doing to try and promote a bit more in, in uh, New Zealand. So, um, what this has to do with uh, programming? Well, let's see. Um, I'm trying to see how many so I get in my slides. Here. Sorry, okay. Um, so writing a, a program that runs on one computer uh, can be done. Um, writing a program that runs on several computers might, you know, it's a little bit harder. Um, what if I am gathering a lot of information and I need to produce some uh, results and analysis of it? Uh, how can I, I do that and uh, do it in a time where I have died of old age waiting for the answer? Uh, and our data set, the MLAB data set, is, is small by Google standards, so it's only about half a petabyte. Um, but you know, that's, that's more than you can fit in your, your flash drive, different. <laughs> uh, you can borrow mine, yours is not enough as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this is, these numbers are old now, almost a year old, uh, but back then I had 530 million individual test results, um, and at the time only about 300 uh, terabytes of actual data. Uh, so if you have a data set that big, um, what do you, you have to do to, uh, to get useful results from it? I mean, you have to noise it. Uh, maybe there's bad data in there. You know, what's bad data? How do you know if, if there is any bad data in there? Um, uh, how do you calculate an average over you know, something that big? Um, turns out it's, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky. Uh, so these are uh, the kind of things that um, uh, we, uh, we look for when we're, um, we're hiring uh, people and we're uh, Looking at uh, interesting problems to, to solve. Because the other the other challenge here is to to do this in a um, interactive way. And I think one of the other big things that's happening uh, around here in this this region specifically, like the Square Kilometer Array Project, uh, it's a big radio telescope. Um, it's a big radio telescope that's uh, be distributed uh, among other places here in Australia. That's going to generate uh, many many terabytes of data per second. Um, that's kind of on the low side. Uh, so how can we actually go through all this and, and make something um, uh, useful of it? And I was uh, fortunate giving a, um, a presentation. Uh, there was a guy from IBM ahead of me, and he was like, oh, uh, well, we have this big database, and it has 90 terabytes of data in there, and it's kind of complicated. I have this big query, and I'm not sure if it scales. It might be hard, whatever. I'm like, oh, dude, that's nothing. I'm 500 team line. Come on, IBM, you can do better. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, uh, uh, seriously, um, I think uh, uh, the other uh, parts, not just um, the importance of writing you know, good code or code that gets a result, but the uh, you know, analysis that you, you have to do uh, to even think about um, writing some code to give you an answer um, in, this, in this case. Uh, I think 
I'll use a, a bad term um, in the presentation with by from uh, our Wiley assessments. You know, there's, there's animals. Uh, our Wiley have a big interest in um, uh, you know, trying to find new areas to explore and document and publish books about. And one of them was uh, this idea of, I think this is probably a, a bad uh, term, but um, they call like uh, big data or like data science. Um, this is actually quite a, an area in itself, just tackling uh, very, very large uh, data sets. Um, it's the actual mechanics of like you know, working with it and, and crunching on it, but also how to, uh, to analyze it, how to uh, <coughs> take a um, description of the problem and you know, either try and refine it or uh, realize that you actually have to write a program that's going to consider every single bit um, and calculate exactly what resources you, you need to, uh, to do that. I think I have a example of something called um, uh, MapReduce here later on. It's a, um, a programming framework that, that we use a lot, a lot of people use a lot. Uh, there are open source versions of it uh, that um, is one way to address a, a certain class of, of uh, big data problems. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm, I'm doing uh, uh, to try and generate more interest in Uh, 
uh, like how much res how much resiliency is enough, and where in the in the system should it be? So uh, the traditional answer to this was um, uh, I used to work on software for phone exchanges, and for phone exchanges they're they're like a terminator, like you can set pieces of them on fire and chop them up into pieces, and the pieces pull back together again, and that keeps working. Um, the uh, that's very convenient for the programmer, but you know it makes the hardware very very complicated and expensive. Um, and to give an example, uh, last time I saw a NC S node uh, memory expansion board uh, for an exchange that's like still use in New Zealand. That board is like you know this big for eight, eight megabytes, eight megabytes of RAM. You have to kind of like physically inspect like a pizza box size. Um, and it's a lot of part of that is the technology is old. The other part is the amount of like hardware redundancy there to, to handle uh, pieces going right down. Um, so uh, to answer uh, to your question, um, uh, we. Uh, in in a, a basic kind of map produce, we have one kind of controller machine that distributes the, the work amongst, amongst things. Um, but uh, if you think about it, uh, it'd be possible to have, because um, so I can't make any comments about like how we do it, but you could have another machine that um, is sharing um, state updates with the first one so it can take over instantly. Um, that way, you can uh, use this concept of checkpointing, you can break the problem into small pieces and have the machines record their state uh, in a reliable database somewhere else. And so you could shoot the machines at any point and know exactly where that machine got to. And if it was halfway through a little piece of work, you can discard the partial result and keep going. Uh, some other things you can do are, um, if you imagine the amount of data that might potentially go through the system, uh, the probability that uh, a cosmic ray will come in and flip a bit of memory from zero to one is actually really high. In fact, it's almost guaranteed um, on a big enough job. So you may actually have to uh, intelligently have uh, the system do the same work twice or more than, or more than twice. Um, have some kind of voting uh, or you know, error checking system. Because the computer, your program may run on two different computers, the same program process the same input data and produce a produce different output because of some uh, either error in your program, like some race condition, or uh, because the hardware itself uh, corrupted a bit as we're writing it. So your framework has to handle that as well. Um, there's a lot, a lot of, a huge number of levels um, to deal with. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's kind of, um, uh, I like to, uh, uh, when I'm doing uh, our out outreach for the Institute of Professional Engineers in, in New Zealand, um, they always tell me to uh, 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 steer them into uh, uh, you know, which, which sort of uh, degree courses or institutions they should look at. And um, I have to restrain myself because I have school C. I have two months of Victoria University, so I have to kind of avoid that. But um, uh, I do have to say, um, and you know, quite uh, obviously, quite truthfully, that the importance of uh, math and analysis is, you know, it's, it's critical. You have to have it. Uh, if you um, if you can't analyze a problem like this, if you can't split it into pieces, if you can't prove that your system can can handle failures, um, then the consequences are, are pretty serious. You know, if you were uh, writing software for a phone exchange and your math is wrong, you can't prove it. Um, you could drop a hole and, and somebody might die because your software crashed. Um, you know, if I, uh, uh, the most popular answer seems to be when I ask people what would happen if I got my math wrong and worked at Google, it's like, well, you know, I might get fired. Yeah, I'm going to produce the wrong results. I produce the, I uh, serve the wrong ads to the wrong people. I don't get revenue um, and I'm out of business. Somebody who writes better software than me, you know, uh, takes my job. Um, so there's a, Wow, I'm going to talk about the random. <laughs> Sorry, any other questions? Hmm. I can so show you more dangerous videos. It, yes. it says here that you've got a software, you're a software engineer, so yes. did you get a degree? No, I have, I have no degree. So have you seen into the, into the uh, part of it? Uh, I'm, I'm very annoying, I guess. I said, so I, um, uh, kind of a weird way. Um, I was in Victoria for about, for about two months, and I wanted to. I got frustrated because um, I, I didn't see a path for me to do something in the, in the near, near term. It seemed to be a lot of theory kind of up front, and I'm a very impatient person, and I didn't want to deal with that. So I went and uh, learned how to become a network engineer. And at the time, um, this is like 1994, 95. <coughs> um, uh, this internet thing was coming along, and I thought, oh, I'm going to learn about TCP/IP. Everyone's like, TCP IP is this weird thing that nobody uses, like, you know, that'll never go anywhere. Um, and I, so I 
have been pretty fortunate. I've selected uh, fairly deliberately you know, to go and find some area that other people are not experts in and then learn all about that. And then when the rest of the world catches up, they're like, they look around for, oh, you know, we need somebody that's expert in this. And I'm like, well, I'm not saying I'm better than anyone else, but I just have to work on it longer than you. Um, and this is what I'm actually hoping to do on a, uh, it sounds also fairly impetuous, but more on a country scale. Like if we get people uh, in New Zealand, uh, we train people to write really awesome parallel code, um, then we can have a very significant uh, competitive advantage. Sorry, so I didn't actually fully answer the question because I went to another round. But uh, um, I went from network engineering, and then I went to, uh, uh, I worked for a company called, uh, a small company here, you know, Telecom. Um, uh, uh, service. And I have the best uh, job interview uh, thinking about it. Uh, I interviewed for Claire and they said that I was uh, too enthusiastic and not a team player. So I went to work for a telecom. Um, and I have the best uh, 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 job reference from them in terms of like words. I got on really well with my manager, but he said, uh, Josh Blair has worked for me for the past 11 months. I can only describe this time as exciting. <laughs> 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 We're great friends, he's like really, I love that. But uh, then I went, to, um, uh, uh, I went to, I got a job with a, um, uh, a supplier to, to Telecom. Um, uh, they got me to move to Australia, then I, I moved to the US, and uh, I applied to work at Google, and after some stressful job interviews, they um, said, sure, you can uh, have a job. So I think it's just, um, uh, it's the old story of you know, being persistent and trying to find something that really interests you and, and train, people try and tell you this is the right way to do it or not right way to do it. I think it's just um, not being afraid of making like mistakes and you can try something and it might not be right so you can just try something else. I think um, uh, one of my co-workers uh, at the university I'm based at now, um, his job is to, to look at why uh, so many uh, students in, in the first year of engineering and computer science uh, fail. A lot of them drop out. Like it's over, it can be over 30%. Um, and uh, certainly in the first year, there's a lot of feedback that for a lot of the students, they, they didn't expect the amount of math or analysis that, that they're confronted with. Um, and um, that certainly causes a lot of them to go away, I think. It's personal opinion. I, I don't know kind of the answer. Um, but uh, I think there's also a bit of, um, from talking to schools, like at different stages, like from primary schools to intermediate schools, um, people have this idea from fairly early on that, that you, you have like a fairly established like progressive path like this is how you you want to you want a job that's up here and so the way you do this is this fairly structured kind of path to do that and um, uh, I try and kind of combat that a little bit saying it's not it doesn't have to be like that it works for some people but you know you try something in your first year and, and you go like oh you know this turns out that that's, that's horrible I don't want to do it that's fine you can actually go and change to something else um, but it does seem to be a prevailing attitude that no you have to you have to sort of know you know, ahead of time. I don't think anyone can really know, you know, at age 12, you know, what direction they're going in. But somehow the later parts of the system seem to be structured that way. Wow. Sorry, another ramble. It's slightly out of my review. Um, IP4, IP6, do you think, when do you think we're going to change or will, will we continue to limp along with? Oh, <laughs> so, uh, IPv4 versus IPv6, so this is actually one of, the, one of the things that I measure. I just turned on IPv6 in New Zealand in lab, so you can actually uh, you can run bandwidth tests or whatever, because there will be, there's a lot of, uh, I call this the, the three um, stages of acceptance in engineering, in any kind of engineering. The first one is like, it will never work. Uh, the second one is like, oh, I have some concerns. And the third one is like, oh, I've always thought so. <laughs> so um, we just got past like one. You know, everyone's like saying, "Oh, I know IPv6. You know, these addresses are so long. Like, well, where are people what's typing them? Yep. Nobody uses that. Like, whatever." And you know, you can actually get to most Google servers now using IPv6. <coughs> most hardware comes out of the box is capable of doing IPv6. And most people, a lot of people know how to configure it and can do things like whatever. So we just got past like step one. And we're at the uh, step two. Well, you know, there's some, there's some concerns. You know, we have to work out. Um, and so uh, that's actually a really long um, uh, grind. And I don't, I don't think I have a good handle on um, how long it's going to take, but I think it's still going to be a grind. But then there'll be like a cliff where people go like, okay, fine, obviously it works. And the, the tipping, um, some of the tipping points are um, one is uh, uh, IPv4 exhaustion, which was going to happen any day now, but it's extended. Um, the other um, where it's actually becoming a problem is um, very large. Uh, 
companies like Comcast in the US that are they're a cable TV provider. Um, what they uh, have a problem with is they are confronted with exhaustion now. Um, you know, your average house now has half a dozen devices that all have IP addresses. Um, and uh, what they want to be able to do is address them directly from the outside. Um, and you can't do that. You, know, well, you can with uh, if you have special configuration, but it's much harder to do that with IPv4. And so they just go, okay, we're going to give up. We just do, we're just going to do IPv6 everywhere. So I think um, if you look at it uh, globally, you have some nice animation somewhere. These, these relatively big islands of IPv6, uh, these really small connections between them, and there will be a, a point where they suddenly start merging. But when exactly that'll be, I, I don't know. Yeah. I had a brief look at the NLAB data because I was looking for interesting um, database queries for school students. Ah, okay. And I thought there must be something there, but I couldn't find it. Would you recommend places to look for to <coughs> suck data out so that kids can so, do um, interesting queries from your data set? Yes, so uh, uh, the reason you probably couldn't find it is um, the way that BigQuery works. BigQuery is a uh, way that lets you query really large data sets with something that looks like uh, SQL. Um, uh, you need to, there's a, a link on there, I'm, I'm happy to go dig it up, I don't have it um, off the top of my head, but you have to sign up for a, uh, to have it enabled on your, your Gmail account uh, to use it. But once it's enabled, um, you have a web form and you can say select you know, something from something. Um, and it's, a, it's very gratifying. Um, like, I, I produce a table every month. Um, last, I think, in November, it's over like 15 billion rows. So it's kind of nice to say, select, <coughs> select account star from November 2011 and we'll go 15 billion, you know, I've got to be exact, what the exact number is. And, and the data in there, what, what would teenagers be interested in in the data set? Um, in, in mine, uh, in particular, um, uh, I, I like to go in and, um, let's see, for teenagers are interested in. Um, I'm really obsessed with uh, uh, counting things and, and figuring out why things are, <coughs> why my connection is not particularly fast. Uh, but for, uh, uh, if you wanted a third party uh, thing, so BigQuery, if you sign up for that separately, you can actually put your own arbitrary um, data uh, in there. Um, it's a good example of some arbitrary data you can put in. So you, you supports like a, you could have like a CSV import. Can be have a really large CSV program in there. Wow, I'm actually kind of a weirdo, so I, I'm actually I'm finding it difficult to imagine what a teenager might want to find. In. <laughs> 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 Some of the students have got the database from Internet Movie rating thing where you put in your movie preferences and suggest other preferences. Oh, okay. So you can get a database of that, and if you can write a, an engine that works out better recommendations, even just a few. Yeah, there you go. Point better recommendations, you can make them lots of money. So there are people <coughs> trying to make good recommendation algorithms out of their movie recommendation outcomes. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, teenagers motivated by money, of course. <laughs> <laughs> money and cool movies. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the um, the other uh, neat thing about it is okay, so it's it's like SQL, so it's not like a complete programming language by any speed, but um, the key part of it is like interactive. So that's the other part is. Uh, uh, you get used to like working with a data set or like asking kind of basic questions of it that informs you on now that you know kind of what your data look like, how to write a, a program that does something more useful, more in depth kind of with it. All right. So I should stop it. Well, as you know, when I look at you, I thought it might be interesting is um, just the uh, you've, you've been working in at in Sydney. Um, just a little bit about the working conditions and so on. Uh, obviously, 
critically concerned about you know running a running a business. You know, we're really focused on you know we're doing this to you know do do good things, but we're running this business. You know, it has to be it has to be profitable, and we have to be moving very quickly. Um, and so the, the pressure on you um, is, is pretty high. You know, you're expected to produce produce results. Um, we have a um, uh, a process where uh, you are reviewed um, uh, every quarter. Um, in fact, you, you actually have to publish for a quarter. You have to say, "This is what I expect to do by the end of the quarter." Um, and then you uh, you have to rate yourself. Your manager rates yourself. You actually have peer reviews. And this is uh, the other interesting thing about it is um, if you want to be promoted at Google, promotions don't just come to you. If you want to be promoted, um, there's a promotion ladder, and you have to you have to make a case. You have to write up a case saying, "I think I should be here because of one, two, three, four. And then you have to find people of sufficient level who will write the same thing to convince, convince them. And the other nice thing is, um, your manager is just a person who votes kind of in this decision. So um, if you have a whole bunch of peers that say you're doing an awesome job and you don't get on with your manager at all, and you think you know, that you're just totally miscommunicating, um, you can still get promoted, you know, uh, provided you're, you're doing an awesome job. So that's um, something that really uh, appeals to me, like really personally. This it's a lot of you know overhead. You know, you have to do a lot of uh, self-promotion and, and uh, you know, work hard and, and convince other people to see you know, what you're doing. Um, but on the hand, it really um, there's a really great culture of you know, everybody is, is there pulling their weight. Everybody is there to do something. Um, you know, there's, uh, occasionally, if somebody somehow makes it through the hiring process who's not that kind of person on the side there very quickly, you know, gone. You never have to worry about oh, you know, the person next to me is, is not you know, working as hard as I am. The good thing though is. Uh, um, they really, uh, as, a, as a company, care about the, the end result. So, provided you can produce the result and prove that it's a good result, it don't matter, too, don't obsess too much about how you got there. Um, and I think this is, uh, I'm really, really grateful to them that, um, unlike a lot of uh, other employers that would say, you know, look at my lack of degree and, and say, you know, instantly, you know, I probably wouldn't even get a phone call. The guys were like, more, well, okay, just, that's just a piece of information, you know, let's, Let's see you know, if you can do something useful for us. Um, I think that's really, really um, enlightened, and I'm really uh, grateful to them, and I, and I wish uh, more companies had that same, same approach. Um, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself as a you know, student in high school, what, would, what advice would you give yourself for studying? Like if you were going to make a career to yourself or a direction, what would you study now? Um, uh, Probably the same thing as like whatever you would find interesting, because I think the um, it sounds like really corny, but it's like you know whatever it, it is it's going to be that's going to make you happy. So um, it makes me really happy to go and build silly, dangerous machines and and uh, things that can, can't possibly go wrong, like whatever. So I, I uh, studied a little bit of physics and a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of you know electronics, that kind of thing. Um, and I wish I had uh, discovered that that less structure in my own personal circumstance would have been better earlier on. Because I, I kind of got to school C level and I'm like, oh, there's this nice path, all I have to do is go. Um, this is not it's not true. It might work for other people, but it just doesn't work for me. I think just, you know, you've got to um, to put that like another way, like uh, at least when I'm I'm talking to the kids now, just say just don't don't be afraid of just trying to do something that interests you because it only really matters in the end if it's going to make you happy and you're going to feel fulfilled. You know, if, if you if you want to make lots of money and that's really what's going to do it for you, then sure, you know, go and do something, you know, it's going to do that. But, you know, why bother in this year? Okay. Uh,